Welcome to Exodus chapter 37. This is the last week for our Bible study. I'm at home because my computer's busted. Now my other computer, the camera's not working. And so this last week we'll be doing it from here in my basement. Uh, let's turn to Exodus chapter 37. And as we do, let's begin by looking at verses 1 through 5. Verses 1 through 5, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. Two cubits and a half was its length, a cubit and a half its breadth, and a cubit and a half its height. And he overlaid it with pure gold inside and outside, and made a molding of gold around it. And he cast for it four rings of gold for its four feet, two rings on its one side and two rings on its other side. And he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold and put the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry the ark. One thing I'll warn you about these last chapters is you're not going to see anything terribly new going on, but it's going to give us an opportunity, first of all, to consider what God thought was important. Uh, it's so tempting to skip over parts that seem to repeat what we've heard elsewhere or read in other places, but you know, God put it there for a reason. So while we may not read all the way through, we certainly are going to cover those areas. Also, in taking a second pass uh, through certain topics and, and issues, we sometimes find things that we did not find before. In this case, remember that uh, a cubit and a half is probably, well, a cubit's 18 inches, so a cubit and a half would be about 27 inches. In other words, the ark was about the size of a very large bench. It would have been something humanly possible to sit on. And in fact, the dimensions of the ark pretty well matched the dimensions of royal thrones back in those days. So God is the king of Israel, and yet he gives himself human dimensions it kind of makes you wonder, uh, would God ever come in human form to rule over his people? And of course, as Christians, we know the answer. Also remember the contents that go into this ark, the Ten Commandments engraved in stone, Aaron's uh, budding rod, which is something that is not covered in Exodus. You have to look in numbers to find out about that, but it basically becomes a a symbol of leadership. And thirdly, a jar that contains some of the manna that God had provided. And so we see the commandments, God's will, Aaron's rod, God's uh, leadership, and the manna, God's provision. All of these are wrapped up and encased in the Ark of the Covenant. Taken together, they show mankind's relationship uh, with God and what it was before sin entered into the world. But where even one of these is missing, then everything falls apart. For example, as you look at the chart that I put at the bottom of the page, if you had the Ten Commandments and Aaron's rod, but not the jar of manna, then you would have God's will and God's leadership, but none of his provision, which, which would lead to the emptiness uh, if you had the bottom two, but not the top, Aaron's rod and the jar of manna, but not the Ten Commandments, then you would have God's leadership and God's provision, but no clue as to where God was leading you or what he wanted done. And that would have to lead to a sense of lawlessness, kind of what our country is going through right now. And if you left out the middle, Aaron's rod, and simply had the Ten Commandments and the jar of manna, then you would have God's will and God's provision but not his leadership, and that could only lead to frustration. We also see that there are four rings of gold and poles, uh, which is a reminder that this relationship that God has with his people, that includes all three of these aspects. So a complete relationship is one that goes with them wherever they go. Let's move on and look at verses six to nine. And he made a mercy seat of pure gold, 
two cubits and a half was its length. And then it goes on and describes this mercy seat, which if you will recall, as we see in the picture, is the lid that went on top of the Ark of the Covenant with two angels on either side looking down and their wings hovering over. Um, this mercy seat with this lid uh, recalls and, and reminds us that God has not only his own presence to consider, but he puts other people in charge and present over our lives that remain unseen, basically these angels. But angels are also in this situation a symbol of warning. They're cherubim. And if you will recall, it was cherubim that God sent or placed at the entrance to the Garden of Eden, warning people to stay away. Now we have these cherubim on top of God's mercy seat, warning them to stay away. Uh, God's presence and his mercy is not to be approached lightly. And so God comes to live with us, and yet he keeps us at arm's length. What does that say about uh, God, and what does it say about us? Well, I think it says a lot about the holiness of God. And it says a lot about our sin. Let's move on and, verse, and look at verses 10 through 16. Here we see a review of another piece of furniture in the tabernacle, the table of showbread, or sometimes uh, it's pronounced shoe bread, S-H-E-W-B-R-E-A-D. I think that's just an old word. Uh, but we have it also overlaid with pure gold. Um, verses 10 through 16, he also made the table of acacia wood. Two cubits was its length, and then he goes on to describe it. I underlined in verse 11, and he overlaid it with pure gold. Even though the table was made of wood, the table and all of its utensils were eventually covered with glorious gold. And if you recall, everything about the tabernacle says something about the Christ who will come. But this table, this gives us the very body and blood of Christ, the bread and the wine. Here we see Christ focused and concentrated. And we see Christ who, in his original appearance to men on earth, seemed to be made of wood, or rather, flesh and blood. Nothing any more special than anyone else. And yet, he was glorified. He ended up shining like gold. And that is, is something we see repeated as a theme throughout the different furnishings and the panels that make the tabernacle. People sometimes mistakenly think that bread is the staff of life. But on this table, God would remind us that even the bread comes from him. God is the staff of life. He is the one that first breathed the breath of life into the nostrils of Adam based on Adam's creation. Who is the staff of life if not God? Here's another question. Who identifies himself as being the bread of life in John chapter 6, verse 33? We also eat bread for enjoyment. And what enjoyment does the Lord's Supper give to us? It's a spiritual enjoyment. But can you can you put it into words? And finally, this, this bread was replaced with fresh bread once a week on a regular basis, which raises the question for us, why do we receive communion on a regular basis? All of these are questions worth pursuing. But for now, let's move on and look at verses 17 through 24. He also made the lampstand of pure gold. He made the lampstand of hammered work, its base, its stem, its cups, its calyxes. And it goes on to describe this one piece of furniture in the holy place that was made of solid gold. There was no wood frame underneath. It was not overlaid with gold. It was gold solid through and through. And it was meant to almost look like an almond tree branches, flowers, and all. 
because if you recall, the almond tree is the first one in, in that part of the, the, the world, in, in Palestine, to set out its flowers. It does it in January or February. And so it gives us this image of resurrection. It gives, it gives us this image of God's grace entering into uh, our winter of desperation and desolateness. And that is exactly what we have when Christ comes to us. And it is hammered out of a single piece uh, of pure gold, as I underlined at the bottom. And this pure gold is a reminder that this is something that is solid through and through. This is not like Christ because this is another aspect of God. In fact, just as the table of showbread sort of prefigures Christ, so we could also say that this lampstand prefigures the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, who, uh, who, who oftentimes is portrayed uh, with the, the pouring and anointing of oil. And the oil that goes into the lamps creates flames that give off light. And we can't connect those without also connecting the lampstand with the Word of God, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit, in which we come to believe through the Holy Spirit. And in that regard, the lampstand also becomes the churches on earth because we are filled with the Holy Spirit, guided by it. And as we respond and, and burn brightly with what the Holy Spirit teaches us, we become a light to the world. In all of this, we see God creating a model on earth in the tabernacle of what the church ought to be, but even more, of what heaven itself is above. Let's move on. Uh, there is a third piece of furniture in this front chamber, what we call the holy place, and it's the altar of incense, verses 25 through 28. He made the altar of incense of acacia wood. Its length was a cubit, and then it goes on to describe how this was made. We've looked at that before. Uh, this altar of incense has a unique position because we've kind of seen two persons of the Godhead. Jesus represented, if you will, by the table of showbread. The Holy Spirit represented, if you will, by, uh, by the, the seven lamps. So there's God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Is this God the Father? No. God the Father is seen on that throne on the Ark of Covenant, sitting on the mercy seat, hidden behind a veil. So what is this piece of furniture? This is where the incense is burned. This is where the prayers of God's people come up before God. We see this referred to throughout the Old Testament. In Psalm 141, verse 2, Let my prayer come before thee as incense, the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. We sing this in church, don't we? Our prayers go up like incense in Revelations chapter 8. Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, and having a harp, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And so here, our prayers rise before God's very throne and they make it right through that fabric veil and make their way to that mercy seat. Let's uh, move on and look at verses 30. Well, let's look at one verse, verse 29 of Exodus 37. He made the holy anointing oil also and the pure fragrant incense blended as by the perfumer. These are sort of the last elements, uh, the lubricants that make all the rest of the stuff come alive inside the tabernacle. And in these we, we see the spirit, the life, the, the dynamic interaction in our own relationship with God. Uh, the tabernacle truly is a place where God meets man. It's a place that's filled with the senses. You've, you've got the sight, the smell, the feel, uh, the sound, uh, 
especially as the high priest is walking around with those bells jingling at the bottom of his robe, which we'll look at before this week is over. And all of this is is meant to be a placeholder for that that ultimate interaction we will have with God up in heaven above. And so one might reassign all of the tabernacle to Jesus in this way. I've said before the tabernacle is is a model of heaven put down here on earth, and that's true. But we could see the entire tab tabernacle is also being a model of Jesus. The Ark of the Covenant is Christ our atonement, because there is where atonement for sins are made once a year. We could say that the table of showbread is Christ our sustenance, because he he supports us and, and fills us with his body and blood, nourishes us in our faith. The lampstand is Christ our light, who lights the way, and his word is a light unto our feet and a lamp unto our path. And finally, the altar of incense is Christ our intercessor, the one who brings our prayers to God above. In all of this, we see God showing his grace and his mercy. Next time, we'll look at Exodus chapter 38. See you then.